people seem to think success happens overnight. Total cliche, as you know, it doesn't. Um, you know, you know, if you enjoy doing what you're doing, just go hard with it. I think that's the best advice. Be patient, and persistent, um, learn from others. So today I'm joined by Ian Bell, and Ian is the founder of perhaps the most successful bootstrapped media company out there, Digital Trends Media Group. They serve more than 125 million unique visitors each month across their platforms and partners. It's an award-winning publishing company. They're millennial-focused with brands including Digital Trends and The Manual and a number of other titles that maybe we'll talk about today. And the interesting thing about them is that they've grown as a bootstrapped company. They're a huge media company now, uh, but since 2006 when they started, they got some angel investment, but they are bootstrapped. They have not not had any external funding whatsoever. And now they've transformed it into a 50 million media giant. Uh, So keep listening to today's podcast to learn how to build, if you want to do this, the world's (laughs) biggest digital technology (laughs) publication. Hey, Ian, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here, Ben. And I want to, I think this is a fascinating story because most of the big media companies out there obviously took on venture funding. You've avoided that, managed to do it bootstrapped. So I'm curious though, your, with your origin story, how it all started when you, when you started, okay, I'm going to build a, a competitor to the likes of, I guess, CNET, Mashable, um, deciding to get into that space what what happened on day one how did this all start uh by accident so (laughs) wasn't intentional uh you know when dan and i met uh back in 2001 we just had a share um we just shared a lot of passion for uh internet businesses you know um we were both big into gadgets i was working at uh intel at the time he was at microsoft and um if you remember back in the day Blogs were just starting to take off, right? You can get on these platforms. You could write about whatever you wanted to write about. And that's what we did. And, um, you know, we had a bunch of these goofy little websites. We even had a little internet radio station that uh, that we uh, kind of set up so we could share each other's music. Dan was up in Seattle. I was here in Portland. We'd upload our music to the Shoutcast media server. I could listen to his titles. He could listen to mine. So we were really just kind of messing around. And, um yeah. You know, a few years later, somebody came to us and said, hey, you know, I'm a huge fan of the site. I've been reading you guys for a while and I want to advertise. <laughs> and I remember asking him questions and he goes, yeah, you know, I'll give you some money. We'll put this banner ad up on your site and um, here's what you would use for your ad server. And every month, you know, we'll, we'll pay you. And I said, okay, okay, that sounds simple enough. Like, what are we talking about as far as money? And he goes, you know, we'll start small, at like five grand a month. And I remember thinking wow, that's not small. Like that's a lot of real money there. And um, so we took that money and we just kind of figured it out. And, um, you know, it wasn't until about 2006 that I said, you know what, let's let's make this a real business. And we launched a new site called digitaltrends.com. We got rid of all the little like, you know, messy kid sites that we were goofing around with. And, um, you know, that's that's how it started. And uh, I'd go on these road shows where, uh, you know, I'd fly from Portland to New York and I'd go into the, you know, I'd meet with these big ad agencies and I'd get laughed out of the room because I'd go in there with our hundred thousand, you know, readers a month. And they were like, are you kidding me? Like, I can't, I can't believe I even set aside an hour to listen to this guy. And uh, I just I kept doing it over and over again. And uh, kind of our first big break was uh, through an ad agency called Dentsu. So pretty large. I'm sure you've yeah. probably heard of them. And uh they had a client called, uh, uh, their client was Canon. So Canon uh, cameras. And they said, look, you know, we'll start, you know, you've been persistent. We'll give you $50,000. And I remember like my mind was blown. And I, I remember sitting down with the team. And I was like, all right, how do you want that spread out over the course of the year? And they go, no, that's for a month. And I remember going, uh-oh, <laughs> how am I going to serve these ads? Like that's, that's a lot of money for a month. And uh so I called up a bunch of my friends that I knew had websites as well, you know, like, you know, hey, Ben, I've got this ad campaign. Can I run ads on your site? I'll give you 50 percent. And uh, then I went back to Canon and Dentsu and said, look, I've got these five other sites. They're all really good. I'd love to spread your ads out over these sites. 
and they said, yeah, no problem. We'll give it a shot. And that's where I think for Dan and I, you know, we really cut our teeth on that and said, okay, you know, we figured it, it out to a degree. Uh, let's replicate this. What other companies can we go to? And look, if we get laughed out of 20 rooms and get one deal, that just means, hey, look, we've got to, you know, we've got to hit a hundred companies to get enough money coming in. And uh, that's really how it started. And, uh, you know, we just kept kind of fine tuning the site, looking at what our readers were interested in, what type of content would take off. Um, and it just kind of went from there, you know, a lot of trial and error. Yeah, so I'm I'm intrigued though that you started with when you decided to get serious. You started with trying to find um, advertising partners to work with, and you were going and you were trying to source direct deals yourself, or you. I guess right. you're going through the advertising agencies. But what made you decide to go? Because that's quite a direct route. I think most people, <laughs> when they're starting out, will try and get adwords or something on their site. What made you think? That was a, what made you choose that route? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think Google was around back then as far as like AdWords. I don't think that product was right, around. Yeah. Um, I think there were some ad networks maybe that were starting up. Um, I think for Dan and I, we were just super naive in the space. We didn't know any better. Um, we just said, you know, wow, if this, if this company came to us and wants to advertise for five grand a month, you know, I think it was a small computer case manufacturer then we've just got to find more people like that, you know, and we'd reach out to, you know, contacts at these companies. And oftentimes they'd say, look, uh, we're interested, but you have to go through our agency. So that's really how it happened. And, um, you know, I remember we got an RFP once from Seagate, you know, hard drive manufacturer. And I looked at that RFP and I put together like, you're going to laugh, like a three year marketing plan for them. <laughs> and, and and really it's you know it's just this dumb little rfp you fill out a spreadsheet that's all they were looking for i put together this whole marketing plan and uh of course they were like hey you know these guys don't know what they're doing you know they look big but they're really not so just a lot of trial and error but uh yeah i think i think the mindset was you know don't be afraid to just pick up the phone don't be afraid to go in there and pitch your company um why share fifty percent of your revenue with an ad network if you could just go directly yeah. and do it? Um, you know, it's scary. I think that's the truth, right? I think a lot yeah. of people are afraid to do that. Um, but for us, that was you know we were you know seventy five percent naive and twenty five percent probably overconfident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, John. I think it, what's fascinating is that it's actually quite similar to my story, in that I think actually I did try with AdSense. Um, early on on my websites and was massively disappointed when I at the end of the month would get $10 or something. And so decided, hey, well, this, this just isn't worth doing. So I'd rather not have the ads than have $10. So, um, so then, yeah, then I got people began contacting me directly and asking to be on the site. So I thought, hey, well, yeah, why don't I go directly? And I think actually this whole actually developing direct partnerships is super interesting and also i think really rare in the world of digital media today because most people think oh well i need to use an ad network and i don't think you need to use an ad network at all you can build your own um and then you get a lot you make a lot more money because you're developing these direct deals that's right yeah i always laugh when i see some sort of new startup pitch for a digital media company and their model is based on google adwords or some ad network, right? I mean, it's literally on there. Here's the CPM we're gonna get. It's a $2 CPM based on Google. And I'm like, well, why don't you just go and talk to a manufacturer directly, right? Or a brand directly and get that from $2 to 10, right? Yeah. Like really go in there and show the, you know, the value proposition and why your audience is important and, and get that up to $10. And uh, it's, it's interesting how it kind of just naturally gets ingrained in the minds of, uh, you know, digital media founders. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the, and there's so much that when you're developing direct deals as well, the other massive benefit for us at least has been that you're able to track ROI much better. So you you know how effective your ads are because you can give your partners tracking pixels and you can track conversion rates. So it, the whole thing's a lot more effective. Then you have a story to tell about how effective your media brand is in order to so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a no brainer to me. 
<laughs> but I'm, I'm yeah and so you obviously you were kind of dabbling in building websites um playing around with the the world of the internet but what's kind of your why why did you decide on um i mean you talked about you were kind of interested in technology and gadgets uh but why why start a digital media company though i still what what gets you out of bed or what made you think hey when you decided it's time to get serious we're going to do this why why start a digital media company yeah good question um it's a lot of fun. I mean, it really is, right? Uh, the digital media landscape is changing every single uh, day. You know, I think for us in general with technology, um, when we started the site, you know, Dan and I, of course, have a tech background. My, you know, I grew up uh, in a household. My father, uh, engineer at Intel for 30 years. Uh, I always loved technology, but I also liked the kind of the design element of it. The, um, yeah you know, the way, the way products looked and interacted uh, with you. So, you know, Dan and I, you know, we focused on that when we started Digital Trends, usability, how the product makes your life better, um, the design aspect of it. And I think, you know, we were very fortunate to be at a time where uh, technology was being adopted a lot quicker than what it had been in the past, right? You know, when I was growing right. up, it was beige desktop computers and, you kind of had to know how to load windows on a PC and it was, it was quite the feat to even get a game to work on a, on a, on a PC. And, um, you know, we hit it at the time where cell phones were starting to take off, TVs were starting to take off. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people just shared in that interest, right? It's, you know, you talk to most people nowadays and they use technology for everything, right? Whether you're a parent right. picking up your kids at a soccer game and you're using snap or you're using Waze. um, uh, or Team Snap, rather, um, but nobody really knows the processor in their phone, right? Um, and they certainly don't know the details of that processor and why it's you know important. What they do want to know yeah. is that that phone can stream, you know, the latest football, you know, the new football game on there, or uh, it has the technology to just get through the day. Um, so I think we're at a, at a really cool kind of inflection point with technology, right? And so tell tell me a bit about what you're trying to build now. Like Digital Trends has obviously been super successful. You've launched other sites, including in Spanish, uh, the manual. But what's your what are you trying to what are you trying to build now and who are you trying to help through that? Yeah, good question. So for us, you know, the audience that we're really targeting is the Henry Millennial. Uh, Henry's an acronym that was kind of uh, coined by Wall Street, uh, Goldman Sachs, high earners, not rich yet. Millennials. So when you think about that median age, right around, you know, 30, 34 years old, um, they have their first nice paying job. They've started to pay down student loans. Maybe they have their first car that they're buying. Um, and what we found is particularly through digital trends is that the content we create really resonated with that, uh, with that reader. And so we looked at the data there uh, to really understand why that content is resonating. And, and we said, look, if, uh, you know, to use a metaphor, if digital trends is the home theater and the technology you have in your home, you know, the manual would be the food, the place you travel, uh, the clothes you have in your closet, all around that Henry Millennial lifestyle. And so what we found is, uh, you know, the manual taking off, we said, okay, what are some other interests that, you know, these Henry Millennials have? Um, where are they traveling? Um, when it comes to pet products, just launched a pet site called pawtracks.com. Uh, and so it's kind of a hub spoke, uh, you know, model of really tapping into those interests. Yeah. I mean, tell us about the process then. So you're launching new properties. Are you, is your process the same? I mean, you talked about this hub and spoke model, but you're, you're launching sites, you're trying to build visibility, you're trying to build your readership. Can you explain um, yeah, the, the process around that and how, what you actually try and do when you're, when you're launching something new. Yeah. Uh, so good question. Um, you know, we definitely have created a formula around it now at this point. Um, what's, you know, what are the, uh, you know, the interests that, uh, Henry millennials are, are into. And if we launch a new site, can we monetize that user more than once? Right. Um, you know, so we look at kind of that site, that model, and we say, okay, 
we know Ben's coming to the site, we can show him some banner ads. Can we get him signed up on a newsletter? Are there some affiliate links that we can get him to click on? Um, how do we really monetize that user multiple ways? And um, I think that's the key. You just, you start out that way with a model. Uh, you have to understand that there are no overnight successes with digital media. I mean, there just isn't. Um, you really have to take your time. So yeah. don't, put a, uh, don't put a lot of, uh, you know, capital into that new model. Get the site up. Um, start A-B testing how people use that site, what type of content resonates well with them. And, uh, you know, take your time. You know, it's going to take, what, a year for Google to really pick you up. And, you know, if, if you know, you're trying to get users uh, to come to the site via SEO, it, it takes time. So sit back, be patient. Um, start to see how people interact with that site. And when you get traction in an area, amplify it. Keep going there. Um, I think too often in digital media, you just, you get people, you know, founders that uh, go out and they raise a ton of money. And yeah. a lot of that really doesn't matter, especially if you're dependent on Google for traffic or building your social media audience. Uh, you can't fake it. Real engagement wins. And you just have to take your time. That's it. I mean, so time is one of the ingredients the the, strat the strategy though i think is interesting where you're saying okay well let's look at the, the kinds of things that we think people are engaged in and interested in and things that are merging how then are you deciding how much content to write out of a kind of seo orientated perspective versus a more i guess lifestyle or, or editorial perspective on the site because you've got a bit of a you've got a blend you've got a blend there and so as you're building out the audience how are you kind of um mixing those things together and do you have a kind of a strategy that you employ to get that balance right yeah uh we do i think you know the biggest mistake that uh people make when it comes to digital media is assuming that people use the internet for one thing <laughs> right People use the internet for research. They use it for entertainment. They use it to find uh, answers to their questions. And there's no reason why you can't solve for all of those, right? And so for us, when we look at our content, we, we go, okay, what's content that we know is going to be really engaging for a user that um, is going to come to the site on a regular basis, right? Opinion pieces, op-eds, branding your writers, um, we know that that resonates really well with people that are a fan of the site. Now, on the other hand, people might just go to Google and type in, you know, how do I get free lives on Candy Crush, right? <laughs> like, that's just a real basic one. Um, yeah. And, you know, put that up there. Create an article around that and know that there's a high likelihood that that user might not come back. If you're lucky, they go to that article and they get the answer that they need right there for the game that they're playing. And... Um, you get them to sign up for a newsletter or a web browser notification, um, or they just really like the site. And if you're lucky, they go, you know what, I'm going to bookmark this. I'm going to come back again. Right. Um, so you really want to create all these buckets for all these different types of users. Um, some users, you're just going to, you know, they'll stumble across you through a link from another site, bookmark you, come back. Oh, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to you know, come here a lot. Other users, you know, you're going to have to convince through multiple visits, right? Um, but, you you know, you shouldn't choose a single approach. You should really try to do it all. There's no reason why you can't. And so you talked about, yeah, getting people to subscribe and sign up to browser notifications. What, what has been the most effective tactic uh, for you in building that audience to try and encourage that repeat visit? Apart from the editorial content, obviously, um, what's been most effective in terms of tactics to bringing people back to the site? You know, for us right now, uh, newsletter is a big one, right? Um, it's funny how the newsletter is coming back. Ten years ago, it was like, you know, newsletters were spam and they were garbage. Yeah, exactly. And now, of course, they're, they're great tools and resources, um, you know, to kind of filter through the noise and create a curated experience. So we find that that does really well uh, just in getting our readers to come back. Um, our content on other platforms, whether that's social media or YouTube, our, our YouTube uh, audience super engaged, right? Um, you know, they're uh, engaging with our uh, video creators, our editors uh, there on YouTube. It's a great way for us in the video or in the description down below to say, hey, look, 
if you want more detailed information around this product, come click on this link, go back to Digital Trends and check it out. Um, so I think you really just have to keep an eye open, see where, where people are engaging with your brand, uh, figure out ways to get them back to the site, let them know, hey, there's more great content over here. Um, this, this video that you saw on Twitter, it's only a fraction of the video that you would see on the site. It's a lot longer, more in depth on the site. Right. Um, so that's really, you know, the key there. It's, I mean, there's no simple hook. You just have to keep, you know, engage with your, your viewers and your readers. So, yeah, so stacking traffic channels is a, yeah, it's a blend and you can do everything, try everything and see what works. But in the, as you see, I mean, we, you just mentioned there, you, you've seen kind of the effectiveness of email change over time. Obviously you're harnessing new tools like browser notifications, I guess, maybe not new now, but it was a few years ago. How do you, I mean, there's all, there's always options out there, right? Things to, you, you read about think people trying things and um everyone says okay you've got to jump on this bandwagon send everyone texts um and or whatever it might be how do you what's your kind of approach for a b testing i'm curious how you decide what tests to run and then how you kind of execute them are you quite scientific about it or is it more kind of a gut thing you know uh so the answer is yes <laughs> it's kind of a little bit of both um you know, use Optimizely, do your A-B testing, uh, you know, on your own site, see, you know, how people are engaging with your, uh, with your brand. Are they scrolling down the page? Are they going to another article? Move things around. Um, I think that's just super basic common sense. You can use Google for that as well. And then I think, you know, uh, there's definitely a gut approach. Look, if you're, uh, you know, an entrepreneur in this space, um, look at what other brands are doing, right? For us on the newsletter, we need to be doing a lot better. Like we, we get people that sign up for it. Um, we don't monetize it as well as we could. If you look at brands like Morning Brew or uh, The Hustle, Zoe Report, uh, The Skim, like these are brands that rely solely on a newsletter product, right? They don't really have a YouTube page. They don't have, you know, really a good destination site, but they've managed to turn these newsletter products into real businesses. So you know, do your digging, read, you know, read industry news, look at what others are doing and, you know, stop telling yourself you can't do it. I mean, that's really the big issue um, that I find most people have. If you see somebody doing it, tell yourself we should be doing this. There's no reason why we can't and keep at it until you figure it out. So it is a little bit of a mix between kind of that, that gut check and then using technology to A-B test. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're assessing therefore the effectiveness what metric for you is the most helpful or useful in assessing the health of your media business? Is there one one metric at the bottom of your of your chart or dashboard that you're like, okay, yeah, that is revenue per visitor, or is it just bottom line revenue? What's what's the most important thing for you when when you're looking as you look back over the last year and you're you know deciding whether or not you did a good job? What what are you looking at? Yeah, look, I think there's there's a ton of great metrics out there. You know, the industry sta uh, standard is ARPU, if you've heard of that one, revenue per unique. Um, are, are you able to monetize that user more than one way, whether they're on, this, on, on the site or not? But I think the most important metric is, is more of a philosophy. And I think you have to ask yourself, are our readers willingly giving us um, money or are we taking it from them? Right. And I think a bad user experience is where you're taking it from them. Right. When this user comes to the site and I'm tricking them into a newsletter sign up or a web browser notification or getting them to click through multiple pages, you know, because they're not getting the answer that they want right off the bat. You're, you're taking it from them. Right. They're not giving it to you. When you get a user that is really engaged with your brand, that is willingly signing up for a newsletter that, um, is spending time on your site because they want to that's that that's a customer that's that's opening their their pocketbooks intentionally and saying i love what you're doing here you go and i think that's really the most important metric to be honest interesting so you you that kind of brand i mean what we're talking here about is brand value and brand equity right in terms of building trust with your audience so much so that you know they want to come to your site and so, is is net promoter score something that you look at? 
we, we, you know, we don't use net promoter score, uh, although we probably should. Um, you know, I, I saw one of your questions on here. It was like, what's the tool that's most useful for you, right? And I think for me, it's, you know, going through our social media channels, going through our YouTube channels, reading the feedback forms, you know, the emails we get from readers that come to the site. Um, are they engaged? Are they happy? Um, that, I, I think that's the, that's the biggest key, uh, the brand value. It's really easy, I think, online in a lot of ways to be disconnected from your reader or your viewer right? Um, you're not engaging with them in real time. Um, you're not seeing them face to face. It's not like a storefront where they come in and return a product and tell you, Hey, this is, you know, this is really crappy. You know, I want my money back. Um, and you have a sense that, look, if people are not emailing me, they're not giving me negative feedback online, they must be okay with it. And that's, and that couldn't be further from the truth. If people are not happy with your brand, <laughs> what do they do? They don't need to come back right? They vote with their web browser. That's what it is. Um, so I think, I think that's where it's really easy to get blind and not really pay attention and go, oh, wow, we've got, you know, a million signups on our newsletter this month. But if you look at how you're doing it, it's, you know, are you, are you blocking them from content unless they sign up from it? Or are you tricking them somehow? Um, so I, I think a lot of people in the digital media space do that. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, I think a lot of yeah a lot of the conversation that I have is is more about yeah how to make a quick buck rather than how to build a brand that will last you know a decade and I think it's a different mindset right yeah I think that's right and look for us you know we we write product reviews and um, you know if we recommend a product that people are not happy with we're we're going to hear about it right in most cases uh, and if we don't hear about it they're just not coming back so that's a problem and. You know, let's be honest, when you are doing e-commerce online, it's really easy to want to recommend a crappy product knowing you're going to get a big commission. But, um, you know, again, are you, are you taking that from, the, from that reader or are they giving it to you? Which one is it? Yeah. And you have to kind of take, you know, the right approach there. Yeah. And I think this is so important because one of the uh, metrics that I've actually started paying a whole lot more attention to <clears throat> is returning visitors. And what percentage of our traffic is returning visitors versus, yeah, first time, first time users? And I think it is a super interesting metric because it, I think it demonstrates so many different things, including how good your brand is, how strong your brand is, um, the brand equity that you have, the effectiveness of your marketing as well. But if you have a growing number of returning visitors, which could be hard if you are, releasing a lot of content that's driving a lot of new traffic. So, I mean, it's, it's a difficult metric, but I think it's a useful metric when looking at the health of what you're building, because if your returning visitors are high, then you've got something, you've, you've built something that's worth coming back to. And I want to talk about, I mean, you, you touched on this before, but when you, um, different monetization models, when you're looking at a property or a potential area or site to create you talked about uh different monetization models and we've talked at the beginning right there about direct deals with uh brands um but you also mentioned affiliate um so i'm curious as to your favorite monetization model we've been talking about the importance of not taking money from people um but having them give it to us but um what is your favorite monetization model and and how do you see that evolving yeah you know good good question you know i, I would say our favorite my <laughs> personal favorite model um is one we don't have yet and that would be a, a subscription model i think that's the ultimate truth that's you know that's really a model where you're looking yourself in the mirror and saying am i creating real value value here that people are willing to pay uh every single month for right and I think for us, we're trying to figure that out to an extent. Like there's, there's a lot of tech, you know, review sites out there. How do you create one yeah. that is so unique that people want, you know, to pay monthly for that? Um, do you make it where, look, for a small fee, we'll take the ads off the site. Uh, we'll give you an unboxing before anybody else sees it. So I think for us, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, there are great companies out there. Uh, like the New York Times, they do a really good job. And, um, you know, I think that's something we're exploring right now. I think that's the ultimate model. Um, I think 
you know, the smart model is again, diversifying your revenue streams, um, yeah. not being so dependent on a single one. Uh, you know, for us, e-commerce and the team that we have, it's just a, such a phenomenal team uh, that, that Linda has built over there. Um, you know, they got us through COVID, right? When advertisers were holding off on advertising because they were, you know, there were uncertainties uh, regarding supply chain around the products. Um, you know, our e-commerce team really stepped it up and, and helped us. So I think, look, if you're in digital media, you need to build a moat. Like you need to protect your brand and you need to figure out, uh, you know, how you're going to survive tough times. So, you know, for us, you know, we make, you know, we generate revenue uh, about four different ways. Subscription model, like that's probably next. We'll figure that out. That's, that's probably my favorite. That's recurring. Like that's, that's every business owner's dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I, I think this is interesting because yeah, I, I thought the same <laughs> um, with a uh, subscription model. Uh, we, we introduced a subscription onto our site. And I think it's interesting. We've now been doing it for about 18 months. Um, and yeah, I think kind of this goes back to like, how much value are you, are you creating? Like people are willing to pay for value uh, or where they see value and trying to trying to position it in a way that you are creating value and it's something that's worth paying for it's, it's so much of this is about just uh user customer insight and a well, there's two different things it's like what people think is worth paying for and what people actually use so and those are two di those are two different things and i think philosophically people can think <clears throat> yeah i really want I really want X, but then when it comes to it and they have access to it, actually they don't use it at all. They just use Y. And um, people people say things and do different things. And I think that's a massively challenging thing. Well, for us, it has been, as we built out our subscription, it's okay, how do we make something that actually people use? And to be honest, it's just been trial and error. We've just been A, B testing different things and seeing what gets the most engagement um, and, and building out the product that way. But I think I totally agree with this, building this moat uh, that you talk about and stacking monetization models. So yes, do direct deals. Yes, do affiliate. Yes, do subscription because the, the higher your stack is of um, monetization models, the kind of the wider, the deeper uh, the moat is that, that gives you strength to kind of get through difficult times like we've had in the past year. Yeah, that's right. And I think, look, you know, when, when it comes to subscription, we need to think about um, why people subscribe. And you, and you kind of touched on it. Uh, a number of ways. Um, you know, when you look in particular around millennials, they are more connected to the brands that they purchase than any other generation, right? They're looking into that company. Are they using um, sustainable uh, resources? Are they using environmentally friendly dye on the clothing brands that you buy? Um, and so for us, it's, you know, when it comes to the value and why you would pay for something at Digital Trends, what are we what are we giving them of value is there a social currency element where they you know they pay for it and they're and, and they're so excited about paying for it that they uh tell their friends about it and they're bragging about it right um you know you see that now with so many people like oh, what books have you read this week and um so i i think for us we're trying to figure that out i think great brands uh, do that. They're proud to tell people, I subscribe to this podcast or to this media brand. Here's why it's important to me. And it gives them, you know, kind of that, uh, you know, that confidence, uh, that social currency. And so I think for us, yeah. we're trying to figure that out. I think a lot of brands are. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's so true. Now I want to talk about, obviously in building a, a big media company, you generate profits uh, and profits that then you can reinvest into the business. So I'm curious how to find out how you've most successfully redeployed that capital that you've generated. What's been, yeah, have you, have you spent your money and reinvested it in the business? What's, what's worked, what hasn't? Yeah, you know, good question. We, uh, we definitely have made a lot of mistakes in our investment, but that's okay. Um, 
you of course always want to pour fuel on the fire. And what does that mean? That means find something that's working at your business and amplify it as much as possible, right? Um, so we, we always do that when we reinvest the capital. Uh, what are areas that are growing that uh, are accelerating and how do we keep that acceleration going? And then of course we reinvest a good chunk of capital into new ideas. And I think the key to success there is uh, failing very quickly if you can. What's an MVP, minimum viable product that you can get off the ground with minimal investment to just A, B test and see if it's working. And, and if, it, if it does take off, then put more capital there. If it doesn't, then just pull the plug as quickly as possible. Even if you know you need to revisit it at some point and try over again. Right. Um, for us, that's been that's been the newsletter. Like we have, you know, over the years, we've you know gone out and spent a lot of money to get subscribers onto it to try to figure out how to monetize it. And you know, we have stumbled and failed, and we'll we'll pull the plug, reinvest that capital somewhere else, um, and then later on come back to the newsletter with a fresh new perspective, a new team, etc. So um, I, I think that's the key. You have to be. Sometimes your gut can be right. And your execution could be wrong. And I think for a lot mm. of digital media entrepreneurs, they do that. They go, you know what? I, I just know I can succeed here. I've got to keep putting money into it. And um, they might not be wrong. There might be a success path at some point, but you've j just got to you know, pull that capital out and try something different and then revisit it down the road. And I think that for us, that's been the key. So how do you, how do you balance that with there's, because on the one hand, we know like, uh, and, and this is one of your ingredients that you talked about right at the beginning time um how do you balance time and like tenacity with um yeah with failing fast and um because I, I think this is one of the things that i find a challenge is like is this working uh or is this failing or is it just not working yet uh and there's a difference between those two things so how is there a, some kind of yardstick that you use to decide how long to try something for before it uh, before you pause on it? Yeah, that's a, uh, so it is more gut than it is formula. I, although I would say we're we're definitely getting more um, you know kind of process driven in those decision making processes. But um, you know um, you know it's funny. Just encourage encourage people that work with you to try new things. Right, encourage failure. I think that's super important. Um, our, our web browser notifications. I remember uh, back in the day, somebody mentioned, "Hey, we should be doing this. We're seeing it online." And there was a lot of individuals in the, in the company that were like, "Look, we don't want to throw this into the you know the engineering timeline. This is we have no clue if this is going to work." Um, and we just kind of pushed it through very quickly. Uh, somebody had a good idea to try it and. I remember sitting there looking at it going, wow, we're getting a thousand signups an hour. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, wow. And, and, you know, now of course we have over 6 million subscribers on our web browser notifications uh, over half of that, uh, you know, active on a regular basis. So you really just have to encourage uh, people that you work with uh, to go out and take those risks and, and to try them. Um, do you want to give them a whole year to try something out? No, that's probably a bad idea. Right. Um, but if you can, you know, deploy something very quickly, uh, by all means, try it and see what happens. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you don't have the team to make it successful. Maybe, you know, you don't have the vision or the knowledge, uh, to make it work, but at some point you'll run into somebody that knows how to do something better than you, right? Because everybody does. And you'll learn from that individual and you can go back and revisit say, Hey, I ran into Ben. He really knows how to, you know, crush it with podcasts you know, I was able to get some knowledge from him. This is something we can take back and try to do. And so I think you have to be uh, willing to acknowledge that failure, you know, and try it again. And, and too often uh, people just say, hey, we tried it. It's never going to work and I'm never, never going to try it again. So you've got to get beyond that, that mental uh, roadblock. Yeah, that's good. Now, I'm also, I mean, you, you talked about process and operationalizing things. I'm curious in a in a media company the size of yours, what have you been able to operationalize? And I guess I'm really curious as to the things that you haven't. So I'm talking about the whole process of write, deciding what to write about, writing content, creating content, publishing content, promoting content. In that 
in the kind of ecosystem of content creation, publishing, promotion, uh, as well as the kind of infrastructure that supports all of this, what what in your uh, organization is still kind of fuzzy and what's what's really quite uh, dialed? Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, we had the benefit of really writing for enthusiasts, right, of particular categories or products. Um, and so once you kind of, uh, you know, strike it with that reader and you find that that reader, you know, is really interested in that particular product, um, for us, it's definitely an ecosystem around that product, right? Um, what, what does that mean? That means, okay, a new iPhone comes out, we will do a product review. We'll do a comparison. How does that new phone compare to competitors in this, you know, uh, in the space? What do you do with your old product? What are the best apps for that product? So you really can go deep. So that works really well for us. Um, just really tapping into that enthusiast user base. Um, I would say what doesn't do well for us is when we have a tendency to um, try to go too wide and, and, and not deep enough, you know, a mile wide and inch deep. We get into new categories and um, we really just focus on surface level content and we don't go deep, you know, into where that en enthusiast uh, really um, is interested. So that's where we fail. Um, I think too, with, with technology, you have new, uh, you know, new technology that's coming out that people just really haven't adopted yet. I would say virtual reality, mm. that's a big one, right? I mean, how yeah. many companies out there have, have invested in that, in that category but what we found is uh, a lot of our readers, they don't obsess over it. Like they might a game console or a cell phone or a laptop. And so, you know, we definitely fail in those kind of fringe categories. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not a, you know, again, it's always going to be half of your gut and half of a formula. Um, you know, I think for us, we also, you know, take pride in really trying to introduce our readers to um, kind of these up and coming brands that are not super well known. Yes, of course, everybody knows Apple or Microsoft or Samsung or LG, but there's a lot of really cool companies out there that are uh, making products. And, you know, for us, no, we're not going to get a lot of traffic on those because, you know, the search volume is not there on Google. People haven't necessarily heard about them. They're not easy to buy. You're not going to find them at Best Buy but we really take it upon ourselves to introduce you know, our readers to those brands. And so it, it's definitely more of a long game. Uh, the value is, um, you know, it's going to happen six months or a year from now where your readers really appreciate you for that, but it's not, you know, it's not a turnkey buck that you're going to make. So, yeah. I mean, let's kind of dive into, I mean, you, you touched on working out what to write about and kind of going deep on topics. Can you talk through your, your process of deciding that that kind of backlog of content that you're that you have like the nuts and bolts of how are you deciding what to write about how are you commissioning the pieces getting them back what what tools are you using what's your process around getting content out the door yeah um i mean look tools you can use of course google out there to see what the search volume is on a particular you know product or topic um you know, for us, our, we just have such an amazing uh, edit team and they really just know what's going to hit, right? Right now, uh, of course, in COVID, uh, it's a no-brainer. Like, you know, anything related to working from home is going to be huge. Monitors, web cameras, laptops, printers. Um, you also have the holiday season right now. Everybody's snatching up PlayStation 5s, the new Xbox Series X. Um, so, I mean, you could focus on that content all day long and uh you know get a lot of traffic so there's definitely that um uh, you know for us our, our edit team of course has close relationships with the brands the manufacturers out there they know which uh you know new products are going to come out in the coming months uh you know of course they're under embargo on that but they they get to see uh new tvs that come out six months from now right so they kind of get a sense for what's going to take off what's not going to take off so there is a big intuition factor there and then once the products are announced, it's, yeah, I mean, that, that edit team is working with our, our data analytics team to see what's taken off on, you know, social media, uh, what's taken off on Google, and then, and then of course, covering those topics. So a, a little bit of, of, of data science, you know, with, uh, you know, kind of your gut and intuition. And so in terms of calculating the ROI on content, because, again, you, what, one of the things you said was, 
you know, you're trying, what's most effective is going deep on topics. Um, so how do you, how do you calculate the ROI? How do you decide whether or not some, you know, obscure Chinese brand um, with their new widget is worth writing about? Um, yes, it's interesting for us, but is anyone else going to be interested in it? How do you decide, okay, we could write about a thousand things, but we only have capacity to write about a hundred. So how do you, how do you make that choice? <laughs> You're really digging in on this formula. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> So, so take a look at your, you know, if you're a digital media owner, this is it. Take a look at your site. Um, you know, what are the RPMs that you're generating? That's a, most people don't understand what that means. Okay. So you have one banner ad on your site at a $5 CPM. Uh, that means you're getting $5 for every thousand views. If you have four of those ads on your site, you're getting $20 per thousand views. That's your RPM. So take that, right? If you have e-commerce on there and you know what your conversion rate is, uh, you can factor that into your RPM. So if you're spending... $50 on a news article and you know you're only going to get 2,000 views on that news article, are you making money or are you losing money, right? That's the formula. That's the key. Um, sometimes you have to just lose money because you know it's the best thing for that reader. And when you look at the lifetime value of that reader, you're going to make it back on the back end, whether that's six months or a year from now. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, a product review and, you know, you're, you're you know, spend a lot of time on that. Let's say your time's worth $400 to do that product review and you know it's a hot product and you're going to get, you know, um, 100,000 views on that. You're probably going to make some money on it, right? So that's the formula. Dig in there. Um, if readers are really interested in what you're creating, they will, um, you know, they'll spend time on there. You'll get multiple pages per visit. Your view through will be good on your videos. That's the formula. That's that's the secret. That's the key. Um, the biggest mistake I would say that you don't want to make is quick buck. I'm going to get somebody in on a Google uh, search that is really off topic. It doesn't really make sense for my site, but I'm, I figured out how to rank well for that. I get somebody on there. Uh, they spend you know half a minute on that content. And they leave. Yeah, maybe you made some money on them. Great. Um, but is that good for your brand down the road? So you have to factor that in. Uh, you have to kind of, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's no different than any sort of investment. The 10 home run articles you're going to, you know, create around your product reviews that really do well have to cover the losses on the thousand other articles that you just know are good for the long game. So, that, I mean, that's the, that's the formula in a nutshell. Yeah. Can you tell me how much, I mean, you threw out some numbers there about you know writing a piece fifty dollars how much does it how much typically does a piece of content cost you to produce you know it again it depends on kind of industry rates um you know we're right there in that bucket um it could be you know fifty dollars for a news article that's 300 to 500 words for a product review you know it could be i could be totally wrong with this i need to check the edit team but it, you know it could be 400 500 bucks to do a product review uh, you know, why is it a lot more? Well, you've got to test that product. You've got to run benchmarks against it. You have to take it out in the real world and use it. Um, so it's not a, you know, a one and done, right? Um, so really depends on the type of content that you're creating, the length of that content, how much work goes into it. Yeah. And, and can you talk a bit about your stack that you're using internally to manage that content production and even your, your website it, itself? What, what tools do you use to manage all of these production of the content and the publishing of the content? Is there anything that you found that's cool that works really well? Yeah, we use, yeah, we use Asana. The edit team uses Asana. The engineering team uses Asana. So um, anything around projects and timelines, we find Asana works really well. Um, you know, we use WordPress. I mean, it's not, you know, a secret out there. We're a, a, a media company. We're not out to create our own content management system. Um, now, our engineering team, um, you know, really amazing team, bunch of wizards. Of course, we do things like, you know, we cache our pages and, you know, we have some custom features there on our CMS that's really unique to us. But, um, yeah, that's really the nuts and the, uh, and the bolts uh, of it out there. And uh, I'm curious, as you, we've obviously had a challenging year in 2020, but as you kind of 
consider right now what your biggest challenges are what would what are what is difficult for you right now and and what what's on the roadmap for the year ahead yeah i think you know look when you know from an editorial perspective um you know ces is going to be very different this year right coming up uh next month it's going to be virtual i don't know how you do a big trade show like that but um you know our marketing team has done a, a phenomenal job. You'll see, uh, I'm not gonna spoil anything now, but we've done a great job of working with these brands and working with the CTA uh, specifically to create a really good user experience on the site where we can show our, our readers the new products that are coming out. Um, but that's tough, right? Covering a, a trade show remotely. Um, you, know, you also have um, Mobile World Congress at South by Southwest. All of these trade shows have gone virtual. So that's a tough one for us. Uh, the edit team's gonna have to uh, try to figure out what the hot new products are without really getting their hands on these things, right? Um, so that'll be a big challenge. Um, and I think, look, you know, from an advertising perspective, um, you know, consumers are uh, purchasing differently than they have in the past, right? As, as I alluded to, you know, before, uh, they're buying products that they would normally, uh, you know, buy so frequently. I don't think anybody's really thought about web cameras, right? But when you have to do a, a Zoom meeting on a laptop, like laptop webcams that are integrated are pretty bad, right? So people are purchasing different um, differently there. So I think that's key. Um, I think those are probably going to be the biggest challenges for us. Just trying to keep, you know, your, your finger on the pulse of consumer behavior. Right. And for you personally, what is, as leading this company, what are you, what are you working on? What are you, what are you trying to get better at and improve in the year ahead? What's your, what will your focus be? Yeah. You know, for us, it's really, um, I think we could always do a better job of being in touch with our readers and our viewers, right. Um, you know, really going deep into that enthusiast, uh, you know, into those interests, uh, you know, some of our categories, um, that we cover right now, really fringe categories and for us uh, you'll see over the next you know six plus months we're really going to go hard into uh, you know uh, categories like home theater and computing uh, gaming entertainment so really getting back to the culture of technology and, uh, and and really trying to create that destination for our reader um, you know I think you find in general that most people the way they consume content online is they're going to five or ten different websites in a day Right. I go to this site for home theater information. I go to this site for entertainment. You know, how do we become a destination for all those interests? So that's really going to be our focus in the coming years. Nice. Let's finish off with a quick lightning round. Uh, I want to know what is the best advice that you've ever received? Um, I, I would say, like, look, just be patient and persistent. I, I, I think that's the key. Right. Um, People seem to think success happens overnight. Total cliche, as you know, it doesn't. Um, you know, you know, if you enjoy doing what you're doing, just go hard with it. I think that's the best advice. Be patient and persistent. Um, learn from others. And you built a massively successful media business. What do you think of your? Which of your personal habits do you think has contributed most to your success? Um, routine, I think, is a big one. Um, and I would say uh, just constantly learning, like literally just learn as much as you can from others out there. Uh, don't be so prideful that you're afraid to talk to a competitor in the space and learn from them. Um, you know, if you, you know, aspire to be like somebody in your category, that's a lot bigger, get to know them. I think that's the biggest mistake that people don't, you know, don't do. But that's part of my routine. That's, you know, uh, I'm talking with folks at Business Insider and CNET and Complex Media and you know, uh, I mean, there's just so many great people to learn from. So I, I think that's, I think that's it. That's my routine. Like, who can I, who can I network with, you know, today? And, you know, talking of continually learning, what uh, internet resources, to, or where do you go? Um, apart from, uh, apart from your own sites, obviously, are there any tools that you particularly would recommend or that you use regularly? Yeah, you know, they're more sites than tools. Um, you know, I, I definitely, you know, spend time uh, listening to business podcasts. I'll spend time on uh, Adweek, Digiday, Media Post, um, you know, Folio Mag. Just look to see what others are doing in the space. Um, and then, you know, I've got a routine. Like I look through our social media and I look through our YouTube channels and 
look to see how uh, our readers and, and, and viewers are engaging with our brand. I think that's, you know, that's the most helpful. Um, yeah, I can always dip into Chartbeat. That's a, you know, that's a tool everybody looks at. Um, I can always, you know, jump into Google to see, you know, what's doing well there. Um, metrics are one thing, but they don't always tell the whole story, right? Um, but uh, yeah, that's probably, you know, those are probably the, the tools and resources that, that I use on a daily basis. And going offline, what book would you recommend and why? You know, if you have a business with employees, um, I would recommend Culture Code uh, by Daniel Coyle. I think that's a big one. Uh, I just finished that. Um, you know, I've read it twice now. Great case studies in there around Apple and uh, Zappos and how they create, you know, amazing cultures in the company. Um, at some point, if you're a new entrepreneur, you're going to have to delegate. There's only so many hours in a day, right? And you have to understand that um, employees are not going to do things exactly the way you would, and that's okay. Um, keep, keep the goal uh, out there in front of you, and as long as you're hitting the goal, that's all that matters. Uh, encourage autonomy, encourage uh, failure. Um, but great cultures really... Um, you know, they happen because of, you know, support and delegation. Uh, they don't happen because you force it. It's as simple as that. So that's a great book. Cool. And so for someone who hasn't got employees yet, someone at the start of their digital media journey, what is one piece of advice uh, that you give based on your journey of building from scratch a huge media company? I, I would say, look, you, you really have to ask yourself why you're doing it, right? Uh, are you doing it because you're passionate about the category? Are you doing it because you see a market need and nobody's really doing it? Um, could you do it you know, better than somebody else? So figure out what that is. I think that'll be your North Star. That'll, that'll help you with your decision-making process, right? Um, you know, it, success happens super slowly. It certainly does on digital media, right? Um, take your time. Don't, don't go bankrupt in the process. Um, most people that raise capital, you know, especially when you're, when you're new at this, um, you know, you're going to throw away 90% of that money. 10% of it will actually work for you. And then you're probably going to have to go out and raise more, right? You know, that's just the way that formula works. But if you take your time and you're patient uh, and you're doing it for the right reasons, you know, whether that's, you know, because of passion or because you see a market need, you know, buckle up and take your time. I mean, that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Definitely. Ian, where can people find you online? Uh, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. That's, that's probably, you know, the most, um, not on Twitter, um, not on Facebook, but LinkedIn. So hit me a note there. Um, happy to connect with uh, anybody. Awesome. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great having you with us. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. And if you like what you heard today, please subscribe and stay in touch on IndieMedia.club. And please leave us a review too. We could do with some of those. But until next time, thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.